Well, kia ora koutou katoa, no mai haere mai, uh, ki te mana tu haora. Welcome once again, and uh, nice to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming. I'm glad the weather's better than it was yesterday. So today I want to give a, a brief update on the Omicron outbreak, uh, what we think is going to happen next, and also an update on the planning we've done uh, for winter and how that's uh, happening, how that's rolling out. Also, I will outline the findings of an independent review we're publishing today into our PCR testing capacity during the early stage of the Omicron outbreak back in February. I've got Dr Ian Town, the Ministry's Chief Science Advisor, with me, who's going to give an update on the uh, deeper analysis we're doing on our hospitalisation data and what that's showing. Uh, and just before I get underway, though, to note the Ministry's regular 1pm statement is just going out with today's case number. So uh, for the first time in over 300 stand-ups, I won't uh, uh, go through those numbers, I'll let the statement speak for itself. So what's happening internationally? Well, the number of new weekly cases and deaths is continuing to decline internationally. We do know that a number of countries have reduced their testing uh, since about March, so that, that would flow through into a reduced case number, but we are also seeing quite a significant drop in reported deaths internationally, so that suggests uh, that that drop in case numbers is real. Uh, so saying, probably one of the key contributors to that is that, of course, most of the population lives in the Northern Hemisphere where they're going into summer. And uh, I can say from my recent trip to Switzerland that Northern Hemisphere countries are looking very closely at New Zealand and Australia and what happens this winter here uh, with, with COVID. And in particular, the impact of our rollout of that fourth dose of the vaccine and the protection that affords our vulnerable populations. And that is, they're very interested to see what they do ahead of their next Northern Hemisphere winter. Uh, I've got a couple of slides today. The first one is just showing uh, what's happening with case rates around the country. Uh, the grey line is the national all of New Zealand rate, and you can see that that's uh, on a decline uh, right in the middle of the coloured lines there. Uh, we can see uh, in the, uh, the northern region, which is the orange line, as well as the southern end region and the region that's called Tamanawataki, sort of the Midland region, case rates are going down but, down, but they do seem to be going up again a bit in the central region, so the lower North Island region. But overall, we are continuing to see a drop in case rates and numbers. So our average number of cases over the last seven days is now just under 6,000. And the rate per thousand has dropped in the last week uh, to the week ending 12 June. It's 8.3 per thousand, down from 9.3 the week before. Now, one of the things we've done through the Omicron outbreak is look at other metrics, including our... Uh, our uh, wastewater testing results and our surveillance testing of border workers to try and get a picture of just what proportion of cases we are picking up in the community. And in, uh, at that same time, so up to the 12th of June, our border worker testing was showing a rate of about 1.4%, in other words, 14 per thousand. So we're probably picking up around two thirds of the cases with our community testing, which is pretty good this far into the outbreak. And if you recall, Back about a month ago, we thought we were only picking up about 50% of the cases. So one of the things that is absolutely helping our response here is that people are still testing and they're uploading those results. So we're getting a pretty good picture of the burden of uh, infection out there in the community. Of note uh, in that last week is we are seeing an increase in case rates amongst over 65s across the Motu. And uh, that's important because we know that our older people are more likely to have a severe infection and more likely to uh, be hospitalised or die from COVID-19. So a message to everybody out there, please continue to protect our older people and those who uh, are vulnerable because of pre-existing conditions or being immunocompromised. And it's those simple things, wearing masks and not visiting them, please, if you are unwell, stay at home. So encouraging signs in terms of the case numbers, but really that rate of around 6,000 uh, cases a day, uh, on average over seven days, is still about double what we had initially modelled we would have at this time, so it's quite a high baseline rate. Uh, moving then to hospitalisations, uh, this again is nationally, and looking at uh, our hospital occupancy compared to 
what we had modelled. Uh, we have seen it continue to come down but very slowly and it really levelling off at somewhere between 350 and 400 people in hospital on any day. So again, uh, about twice the number of hospitalisations that we had modelled a couple of months ago at this period. And of course, as you will have heard over the last week, uh, in a number of uh, places around the country, a very significant burden on not, on not just our hospitals, but primary care. And interestingly, uh, only about 20% of people who are admitted at the moment to hospital with what we call SARI, severe uh, acute respiratory infection, only about 20% uh, of those people uh, have got COVID. Well over half have got influenza, and it's the influenza A type that is now quite rampant out in the community. So COVID's part of the burden on, on our system, but we have got these other infections. We're not seeing RSV, which is the one that tends to in, uh, infect uh, younger children yet, but it is very much there in Australia, and so we're watching closely for that. The other thing I would say about the, uh, the influenza A that is out in the community is our early data suggests that the subtypes that are in the flu vaccine this year in New Zealand are a good match for those subtypes we are seeing out in the community. So yet another reason, if you haven't had your flu vaccine and we're approaching a million doses having been administered, we've got over two million, they're much better in people's arms than on our shelves. If you haven't had your flu vaccine yet, particularly if you're in one of those vulnerable groups, please do it and it's free for many people. Right, turning now to the PCR testing review, uh, as we've done right through the pandemic, uh, both ourselves and others have done externally, we have reviewed our response to the Omicron outbreak, and in particular, the problems we experienced with delay in processing PCR tests back in February. When our case numbers uh, with that rapid onset of the Omicron uh, outbreak, uh, when the case numbers increased quickly as it took hold, we reached a point where we had to make that switch from PCR testing to rapid antigen testing because we had a high enough prevalence of the uh, virus in the community to merit rapid antigen testing. However, uh, it was not a smooth transition and it became clear that our PCR testing wasn't keeping up with demand. We ended up with a backlog of around 32,000 tests, mostly in Auckland. Uh, and uh, on the 1st of March, I spoke about those, outlined the delays, what we were doing about them, and also apologised to the people whose results were, uh, were delayed and who, who were affected by that. And as of the 1st of March, at that point in time, a third of the people with a delayed test result had already been retested, and we had processed that full backlog by mid-March, including sending some to Australia. So... Uh, at that time, I commissioned an independent review about what led to the processing delays and also uh, a look at our forecasting of lab capacity and why there seemed to be this gap between the testing that was being done and our capacity we had forecast. So today, we're publishing that review, uh, a number of other relevant documents, in, and also our response to the review. The review found four areas that contributed to the delays. Uh, there was an issue around lab capacity, uh, the planning uh, could have been better, our reporting of lab capacity and also uh, some aspects of our organisational internal design. Uh, as one does with these reports, I certainly welcome the report and the uh, recommendations. I think it's a very thorough piece of work and I want to thank those, uh, the team from Allen and Clark that did it. And I can um, certainly confirm that work's well underway to implement all those recommendations. We've strengthened our testing expertise here in the Ministry and alongside Health New Zealand. Uh, we're working with our labs to uh, make sure we put these recommendations into place. And also uh, we're in the process of procuring the PCR capacity we will need to take us through to the end of the year. Uh, the uh, improvements are being embedded in the system and the responsibility for testing around COVID has now transferred to Health New Zealand and we'll continue to work very closely with them on that. Um, and as I said, the review examined the Ministry's role in the circumstances that led to the delays and uh, identified some processes internally. That meant we had some inconsistent reporting of testing capacity. Uh, and it's clear from the findings that we could and should have done better on uh, both estimating that capacity and communicating that nice and clearly. We were updating it on a regular basis, 
But when I became aware of the inconsistencies, I can uh, confirm that I informed ministers, worked with our testing team so we could get a really consistent picture of our capacity for both pooled testing and unpooled testing. I do want to just emphasise, of course, that uh, the issues arose at a time when the health system, including our labs and our testing team here in the ministry, who were working extremely hard, were responding um, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, really, to a rapidly evolving uh, outbreak uh, with a highly transmissible variant. So uh, the teams were doing their best at the time, but it's clear that we can and should have done better. Lab staffing was also affected at the time uh, by what had been a, a sustained and prolonged uh, response, remembering that we were still just off the back of that Delta outbreak. Some of their workers had tested positive for COVID-19, so they were down on staff, and there were some challenges around uh, test reagent availability and distribution. But I do want to emphasise uh, that the, the delays that happened were not the fault of our labs or our lab staff, and they've worked phenomenally right through the pandemic. Uh, as of, uh, so since March 2020, they've processed over 7 million tests through our labs from a standing start. Uh, and it's been absolutely integral to our effective public health response. It's a mammoth effort, and I want once again to thank all our lab staff, um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of them as I've um, travelled around the Motu uh, over the last six months or so. So, uh, as well as the PCR review, which is up on our website now with a range of other documents. We're also uh, releasing some other uh, reports that I know will be of interest. One, one of those is a review into our response last year to the Delta outbreak, which started last August, and had all but uh, been stamped out, actually, by the time Omicron came along. We were down to just a handful of cases a day. That review was conducted late last year uh, and identified some areas for improvement around uh, a more equitable approach to uh, uh, supporting Māori and Pacific and disabled people, uh, about being more coordinated in our response and also ensuring that we sustained our COVID-19 workforce into the future. Again, a really useful report. Thank you very much, thanking the authors very much for that. It's being published alongside our response. Uh, there are some other documents being published, including two briefings by the Implementation Unit in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet about contact tracing and case investigation, and another one on testing. Uh, there's a briefing from the COVID-19 continu uh, Independent Continuous uh, Review and Advice Group, chaired by Sir Brian Roach, uh, and that um, report was to the, minister for the, uh, the previous Minister for the COVID-19 Response, Minister Hipkins, uh, regarding the broader response at that time. Uh, actually, it's probably a good time uh, for me now to hand over to Dr Town and then I'll make some closing comments before we open for questions. Thanks, Ian. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. Kia ora tato. Today I'm providing an update on our hospitalisation data around New Zealand and also a few more updates uh, relating to surveillance and testing, which I touched on at the more detailed briefing we held here last week. So a key part of being able to respond to current and indeed future outbreaks is having a clear picture of the impact of COVID-19, particularly amongst those who experience a more severe illness and require admission to hospital. So over recent weeks, uh, in partnership with our colleagues in the DHB sector, we've been working to improve the collection and recording of information about people who've been admitted to hospital. Now, as you know, we regularly report about the number of people that are in hospital on any given day, mm -hmm. but th there is value, significant value to us in understanding the underlying cause of hospitalisation, how long they spend in hospital, and whether or not they require more intensive support, for example, in an intensive care unit. So the data I've got for you to share with you today is reasonably preliminary, but we will be working this up into more detailed reporting uh, in the weeks ahead. One of the things that we were aware of from our clinical colleagues is that when people are admitted to hospital, it's important to know whether or not they actually have COVID as the main underlying cause or a contributing cause, and our information, uh, the data suggests that that's around two-thirds of cases, whereas conversely, in about a third of cases, uh, the reason for admission is quite a different condition and they happen to test positive for COVID during that time. So that's an important differentiation if we're considering the impacts of COVID on individuals and indeed the wider hospital system. 
Uh, in regard to vaccination, um, it shows the data shows that for those that have been hospitalised with COVID and are not uh, and are not vaccinated, the rate is about six times higher for the, those group who have not been vaccinated or boosted. It also shows that those who are unvaccinated when they are in hospital have a, have a more severe course of their illness and are about three times more likely to end up in intensive care as a result of that admission. Um, so that really underpins the Director General's uh, uh, call for everyone to continue to get vaccinated and, where eligible, have a booster. There has been a lot of publicity in recent days about the demands on our healthcare system more broadly and our hospital system in particular. There's no doubt that our hospitals are busy and there are many people, as is often the case over winter, who are presenting to um, primary care and secondary care with acute respiratory illnesses. This is uh, a pattern that our hospitals are used to and occurs every winter. And as at the moment, a number of these folk are also presenting to our emergency departments as well as general practice and our acute medical centres. So we do acknowledge that at times there have been longer waits than, we, than would be desirable, and we're very conscious of the impact this has on patients and their whānau. We're especially grateful to our frontline healthcare teams around the country who are providing excellent support, along with our colleagues that uh, work on with Healthline at Whakarongaro. All of our DHBs have been very actively planning for winter and have a number of strategies and tactics in place to ensure they can manage demand and particularly prioritise those that require urgent care in a timely manner. And of course, continuing to deliver as much planned care as is possible uh, during the busy periods. So um, the Director General has already mentioned the flu vaccination, which, uh, as he notes, is appropriate for the strain that we're identifying both in Australia and here in New Zealand. So getting that flu vaccine is a key strategy to keep yourself well over the coming weeks. Now, last week, you'll recall, we talked quite a bit about the surveillance strategy and identified seven broad areas where we were working to keep up surveillance, particularly for new variants when they arrive here in New Zealand. One of the key tools that we use, and here we're working very closely, of course, with our science colleagues at ESR, uh, we're working to, to increase the number of samples that can be processed. And ESR and the laboratory teams around the country are increasingly using automation, using a digital platform to help with data sharing and sample identification, so that we can keep up that timely assessment of those that test positive at the border, that's with the rapid antigen test, and then go on to have the PCR test, as we discussed last week. Those who are in high-risk areas or situations, and of course, as I mentioned, we're routinely testing people that have been admitted to hospital with that PCR test and the whole genome sequencing. Last week, we also had some discussion about the reinfection advice. And since that uh, presentation uh, last Thursday, we've been working hard with our public health colleagues and our laboratory colleagues to provide updated advice uh, in the near future, we hope as early as Friday this week. So thank you, Dr. Bloomfield. I'll hand back to you, and then we can take some questions. Thanks again, uh, Ian. Um, great to have you here. Just a couple of closing comments. There's no doubt the next few months are going to be tough. Uh, and the health system can't do it alone. There are things that we can all do to help protect each other and to make sure that our health system is not uh, overloaded and that people who need care can receive it. So uh, we need everyone to do their bit to help us get through winter in good shape. Uh, being up to date with COVID-19 vaccinations, and very soon, of course, we will be starting the rollout of that fourth dose to our groups who are the most vulnerable and whose immunity may well be waning now um, with that six-month gap between the, the, uh, their third dose and this next one. Wearing a mask. I can tell you, having been in Switzerland, where there was not a mask to be seen, uh, that uh, it is an incredibly important thing that we can all do to protect ourselves and others. Staying at home, and in particular, not visiting people who might be vulnerable if you are unwell. This is fundamental to us, uh, not just getting on top of COVID, but as I've said, a lot of those winter illnesses out there now are actually influenza or other viruses. 
the action is the same. Please stay home if you're unwell uh, and uh, do, do do a test. And if that test is positive or negative, please upload the result. It gives us a very good picture of what is happening out in the community so we can apply our health system and public health resources uh, appropriately. All right, I'm now open for questions. Dr Bloomfield, uh, you mentioned, well, you knew on February 20 the National Laboratory Network was at capacity. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you inform the public of this at the time? Uh, actually, uh, what we did do was we shifted very much within the next day or two after that to the use of rapid antigen tests. And the reason we did that uh, was because the PCR testing was at capacity. So uh, I would um, I would counter that perhaps we, we did inform the public and that's what underpinned our shift then to the use of rapid antigen tests. Right, so when you and others told the public PCR capacity had increased to 58,000 cases a day, why did you fail to ask the actual lab scientists if this figure was you know accurate before telling the public? So what I can say is that the figures that we were using for both the pooled and unpooled capacity uh, we're on the basis of the information we got from the labs. And uh, back in December, after a conversation with Minister Verrill at that time, we started to report not just the pooled, uh, but the unpooled capacity. And that was a figure of around 30,000. One of the things that, uh, that uh, puzzled us was that even as we got through February, uh, our testing numbers were around 15 to 20,000 a day, but we knew we actually did have capacity uh, for that unpooled uh, testing numbers of around 30,000. And what became apparent, and I've, I talked about this in March, is that we, where we sh what we should have done and we didn't was interrogate whether or not there was the ability to move those samples around the country. And what, what became apparent, although we hadn't anticipated it, was that once samples were in a lab and were logged on and in the system, it was, it was virtually impossible then to move them to other parts of the country. So the backlog started in Auckland uh, they, they reached capacity even while we had spare capacity in other parts of the country. What we hadn't anticipated, and we should have, and, we, and this is where if we had dug a bit deeper with the lab, uh, labs themselves, we would have got this picture, is that actually we couldn't readily move samples around the country and that's what uh, was a major contributor to the backlog. Sorry, right. Just to follow up on that, um, Director General, the report says that modelling has predicted there'd be a, a break point, essentially, where demanding for testing would exceed unpooled test capacity, but that was never shared with you or, or ministers. How, how does that happen? You know, if you've got something where the data says you will not be able to test past this number at an unpooled level and it doesn't make it through to you or ministers. Do you have any idea? Well, uh, the, th the factors that weigh, weigh into whether or not uh, we would reach capacity were uh, the positivity rate, and, and that the positivity rate went up very quickly, more quickly than we had anticipated it would. Uh, we knew we had unpooled testing capacity of around 30,000, but I, I think this is the point here. The mo even the modelling itself, I don't think, took into account that th we couldn't readily move samples around the country between different labs with different information systems. And I think that was a key factor in, the, in, in, in what led to the backlog in Auckland. Yeah, more, I mean, more broadly, this outlines multiple points of failure in, in planning and communication and, and data collection. Who, who was responsible for picking up this, these errors? Who, who should have and, and why didn't that happen? Because it's across the board. It's not in any one part of the system. Well, that's right. And so uh, for my part, you know, I'm, I'm responsible for the system. So that's why I was uh, the person who fronted the... the uh, 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 media stand up on the 1st of March and first of all identify that we did have the problem and that's why I commissioned the report because it's only by doing that deep dive that we can identify actually where the, where the areas were that we should have done better. Right, the um, National Institute of Medical Lab Technicians, they say the Ministry essentially well ignored them and refused to have them at the decision making table. What do you say to that? Uh, I'm not sure that's what they're saying actually because we were meeting on an almost daily basis and I myself uh, was present in some of those meetings with, with the laboratories and actually we've got a very good relationship with them. Uh, so I think uh, one of the issues that the, the labs uh, has pointed out, uh, the lab society has pointed out is that um, 
there are long-standing issues around the, uh, the sort of the delivery of lab services in the country, and some of these, of course, became very stark and acute uh, when we had that uh, Omicron outbreak and the pressure came, really came on the system. But I think, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate the relationship is very good. Uh, it, it has been throughout the pandemic. The labs have done an excellent job, and it's, it's continued to strengthen. So millions have been kind of allocated to improve testing and lab capacity over the pandemic. Um, so where has the money gone and why has, you know, 5% of the lab workforce left the profession? Well, I can't speak for why the lab workforce has left the profession, but I would make an observation. These people have been working incredibly intensely uh, right through the pandemic and certainly whenever we had an outbreak you would see the testing uh, volumes would go up incredibly rapidly and people were working very long hours to process all those tests. Uh, there will be a range of reasons why people have left uh, and there has been a significant investment in the labs to deliver on the, the PCR testing including in equipment um, but also of course in, in, in the payment for the test. So there's been a significant investment in labs. Uh, I think you know the lab society will be also wanting to make sure that um, the workforce they represent is adequately paid uh, and that's an important part of uh, making sure we that people train in the first place and that we retain them in the workforce. You said there wasn't the ability to move tests around the country. Is that something that will change now and how quickly can that be established, the ability to be able to do that? There was some ability, uh, particularly for, from our major lab provider, which has got labs across the country, so that's uh, Asia Pacific Health Limited. The key point is that our labs have different information systems and one of the... Uh, uh, areas that we're going to have in our new contract with the labs is to make sure that we can, that they can interface their information systems with a national database so that will uh, improve our ability to move samples around in the future. You've said that um, there needs to, well, that one of the responses is that there needs to be a new funding model or that you're looking at a new funding model. Um, how would that work? Do you envisage people eventually paying for COVID tests uh, at the level of the individual? Uh, there is no intention to introduce um, charges for COVID testing and, and laboratory testing is um, largely free in New Zealand. Um, most tests are freely, are freely available. Now there are two aspects to, um, two key aspects to the contract that we want to put in place from 1st of July. First of all, um, uh, our labs set themselves up with a large capacity. Now there's some debate, it's in the, um, it's in the report about just what that capacity might have been, but they were doing at the height of the Omicron outbreak, tens of thousands of, of tests a day. And of course, once we shifted to rapid antigen tests, uh, that volume dropped away and it's now much lower than that, a few thousand a day. So what we're wanting to do is, first of all, contract them to continue to deliver that, but to have that latent capacity to be able to scale up if needs be. Mm -hmm. the, second th the second aspect of that, and I'll come to you, uh, Sam, is uh, we're expecting more of them with the tests they are doing, so there's more complexity. We've got, um, we're testing everybody who's coming across the border. We're then asking people who return a positive test to get a PCR test. We're asking our labs to identify all those people and send all those samples uh, to ESR for whole genome sequencing. And so we are wanting to recognise the extra effort and work that's happening there. So the contract will be about uh, ensuring we can um, recognise the current costs of, of delivering PCR testing, but that there is that capacity in the labs to scale up uh, if or when that is needed over coming months. Um, so. Just related to that, I mean, at, at a higher level, do you think private provision of, of, of testing services of these labs is actually the way to go? There seems to be quite some tension between certainly the unions, I think, representing workers about the conditions, and they attribute that in part to privatisation, do you think a public model might be more appropriate and might have stopped some of these issues cropping up? A fully public model, I should say. Well, we've got a mixed model in New Zealand. We have, um, historically, most of our community testing has been private and most of our testing, hospital-based testing, has been public. There's, there's a mix. Uh, I don't have a strong view either way on this, um, and I think that, you know, again, if we look at the role that our labs have played and that testing has played in New Zealand's response to the outbreak, it's been you know, fundamentally um, successful, uh, our ability to ramp up PCR testing capacity across both public and private, their willingness to work together, um, and uh, certainly their willingness to engage in the discussion about this next phase as well. So 
I think that's a longer term question about what the mix will be and it applies not just to labs as well, it applies to other areas like radiology and uh, the provision of surgical services too. Could this have been avoided if we had enough rats in place as in when we needed them? Uh, there is no doubt that at the time the Omicron outbreak hit New Zealand, uh, there was a worldwide uh, challenge around getting rapid antigen tests, and we were, we were getting them in at that point in time, and by the third week of February, we certainly had enough to make that switch across to rapid antigen testing. Uh, I don't think it was, and it's hard to remember back there, I don't think it was material in terms of that um, timing of the shift. It was really just a matter of a few days, uh, and uh, you know we didn't quite get it right. But uh, it's very clear now that we've got good supply of rapid antigen tests. And, and I do want to just um, reiterate that point that it's um, both remarkable and pleasing to see several months into this outbreak the extent to which New Zealanders, if they're symptomatic, they are testing and they're uploading those results uh, to a greater degree than I think it is happening in any other country. So we've got a much better picture of the, uh, of the outbreak here in New Zealand than other countries do. You said before you introduced rats early, but you knew on Feb 20, so labs were at capacity. Uh, you failed to tell the public this, and yet politicians told the public on Feb 25 that everything was going well with lots of capacity. Why didn't you set the record straight earlier? Well, uh, we were, uh, and, and the politicians on, on February the 25 were making statements based on the information we had at the time. And the information that we had was that we still uh, we're confident at that point that we had capacity up to 30,000 and our testing volumes were only about two-thirds of that. So we were working hard with the labs to do the things that I've talked about and that is to move tests around the country so that we could use the full capacity. And it was over those days that it became apparent that actually it wasn't uh, possible to move them to the extent that we needed to. And the review talks about a new operating model for lab testing. Does this mean the Ministry will be overhauling the way it works currently? Uh, that's just referring to the, um, the, uh, con the recontracting we're going to do with the labs from July through to December, recognising the extra work they're doing now and also maintaining that, uh, that capacity in case there's another surge that we need to deal with. Uh, on a slightly different topic, a question for Dr Town or Dr Bloomfield. If uh, someone is tested positive for COVID, their seven days are up, their symptoms are gone, but they decide to take another test and it's positive, does that mean they're still infectious? Good one for Dr Town to, uh, to respond to. I've had this experience myself, so I'll be interested to see what the uh, Chief Science Advisor says. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, the matter of considerable interest, I think, because there has been, I think, some potential confusion about our initial advice. And as I mentioned, Mark, we are looking to update that advice uh, in the coming days. So we have prepared some advice, which has actually gone to the Director General and will be discussed by ministers in the coming days. You're right that because there is access to free access, everyone has got the rapid antigen test, it is inevitable that they will retest if they if they have symptoms. And so we have this difference between the twenty eight days and then the, the days that follow. So we need to line all that advice up and we need to provide that to our colleagues in general practice, health line and so on and so on, and then we'll bring it back to um, future announcements, hopefully on Friday as I mentioned. Even putting aside the reinfection issue, mm. though, if, if someone is, you know, essentially still in, if they, would they still be infectious after seven days? Their symptoms have gone away, but they're still testing positive on a rat. From what the sort of independent experts I've spoken to have said, yes, they're still infectious. But under the ministry's advice, they're allowed to go to work, and we're getting lots of lots of people are saying their employers are making them go to work while they're still probably infectious. Yeah, so if the, if, the, if the rapid antigen test is still positive, that means there is viral material uh, that is being detected by that antigen test. Uh, we know from the PCR tests, of course, that that test can go on and be positive for weeks or even longer. So we need to line up that advice to make sure that the, the, the public health protections that are in place around isolation are clarified, and we intend doing that this week. So, so if someone's employer tomorrow is saying you should come in, your seven days are up, you know, on, on Tuesday, you're not, you don't have symptoms anymore, I don't care that you're still testing positive, should they wait un until their employee has actually tested negative before asking them to come in? I might, I might need a bit of help there, Director General. What, what do you... <laughs> I guess the first comment I would make is there's nothing special about seven days. You will recall that previously it was 10 days and prior to that it was 14 days. So after seven days there will be some people who are still infectious 
And some of those people will return a positive rapid antigen test if they do it, and some of them will return a negative test. I think the important thing is here is if people don't have acute symptoms, they're much less likely to be spreading the virus. That's the first comment I would make. Second is we don't ask or require people to do a sort of an exit test from their seven-day um, isolation. And the reason for that is because of this. Uh, there will be some people who are positive, but they may not be shedding virus and infect, able to infect others. There will some, be some people who will return a negative test if they do one, but may still be infectious. So here's my advice. Even after your seven days, be careful. You are not required to isolate, in which case then, yes, if you're not symptomatic, you can, and it's certainly within your employer's rights to ask you to go back to work. But keep wearing a mask. Avoid places like age residential care or visiting elderly or relatives or friends who might um, have, be immunocompromised for a few days, and everybody should do that, actually, because you can continue, some people will continue to shed the virus after seven days. You say that some people will, uh, you know, they'll get a positive result, but they're not still infectious, they don't have symptoms, seven days are out. How many people is that? Do you have a sense of, is that, you know, is it a 50-50 chance or is it a one in a hundred chance? Uh, we did do some modelling of this when we shifted from 10 to seven days. My recollection is it's a few percent of people will still be infectious after seven days, just as even after 10 days there will be an even smaller percentage, but there will still be some people who are infectious. So it's a, it's a relatively small proportion of, of people who will still be infectious after seven days. But, but a, rule, a good rule of thumb, and this applies to COVID and, of course, flu or inf anything else, if you are still acutely symptomatic with a runny nose or a cough or a sore throat, uh, or a fever, then assume you are still um, uh, you still have an acute infection and could well be infectious and stay home. But of the people who have tested positive after their seven days with no symptoms, how many of them are likely to still be infectious? Do you have a sense of that? I don't have a sense. I'm happy to uh, come back on that. We can have a look at it. Uh, are your personal infection with COVID-19 uh, went overseas? Uh, I had a very fortunately a very mild Swiss version of the uh, of the virus. Uh, and uh, got to know the inside of my hotel room very well, but thanks, thankfully mild symptoms and um, uh, back, back to 100% again today. But that's not everybody's experience, and some of you may have had COVID, um, and uh, I think many people, many people who are fully vaccinated and otherwise well do experience um, ongoing uh, fatigue for some time, uh, and also what this, this brain fog, uh, which is a, you know, a, really, a, a real thing, but thankfully for me, uh, mild uh, illness, and I was able to get back to New Zealand, which I'm very pleased about. You alluded to um, perhaps testing positive for quite some time afterwards. Is that, was that what you alluded to? I had the interesting experience of returning a negative pre departure test in Switzerland, uh, which is how I got back, um, and then a few days later, um, with a much more, uh, uh, what I would say, um, following the instructions around the swab, uh, returned a positive test uh, here. I wasn't back at work by that point in time, I was only at home. Um, but I dare say, um, and I think we've had this ex uh, expressed by others, that um, uh, in other countries when you're getting a, a swab, that it, it's, a, it's a fairly gentle swabbing, um, I would say. And it, what we are seeing here is that people are following the instructions. That's why we're getting um, a good positivity rate from our, um, from our rat tests here. You talk about preventing um, healthcare overwhelm, but we're already hearing that you know EDs are overloaded, lectures are on hold, and GPs are you know three week waits for them to see people to see, see their doctor. How is the health system not already overwhelmed? Uh, well, the health system is under a lot of pressure. It does um, uh, it does wax and wane a little bit. For example, I was on Friday down in Dunedin uh, visiting the DHB there in the ED and on the COVID ward, uh, as well as in the ICU. They'd had a really um, uh, a lot of pressure earlier in that week, but it had eased off again later in the week and things were more manageable. This is normal, as Dr Town said. We do get these waves. It's quite early this year, and a lot of that is because of the influenza that has come into the country with the borders opening, and that is creating uh, quite a lot of pressure in the system. So the system, yes, it comes under a lot of pressure, and it has to adapt. And one of the ways the hospitals adapt is by, um, by reducing planned care. So they just focus on doing the acute surgery that might be needed so they can redeploy staff and, of course, um, use beds that otherwise would be used for planned care. 
they do that for as short a period of time as possible and then crank it up again. A question for Dr Ian Town if possible. Can you give us an update on the uh, variant planning that you were doing for the government and did you identify any areas in particular that needed to be improved in preparation for future variants? Thank you. So we have uh, made a report uh, through the Director General to ministers and I understand that that's being discussed uh, this week. Uh, in terms of the planning. We also had a really good opportunity to talk with our colleagues in Canada this morning uh, about their planning and it was very interesting to discover that the issues they were worried about were exactly the same issues that we're worrying about. So that is firstly the surveillance that I've mentioned to make sure that if there is a new variant we come a become aware of it. Uh, and they are doing some random testing at the borders uh, in Canada at the moment. Secondly, to make sure that all that planning, and, and it comes back to the search capacity and contact tracing, laboratory preparedness and our, and our public health measures are all uh, there in reserve. Uh, and so we, we would expect that the ministers will be making some further announcements about the variant planning scenarios, you might recall. I mentioned there were five of them that we put, put up. Uh, we're expecting them to provide some further advice to the wider public later this week. Would you like to see uh, greater surveillance testing at the border and random testing at the border introduced? I think we're doing pretty well. I mentioned the surge capacity that ESR is developing to improve the number of samples they can process. We're getting good cooperation from people returning to New Zealand uh, who are asked to do a PCR test. It's not necessary to test everyone to get a good handle on what the risk is. And of course we've already identified in the community testing through the hospitals that there are cases of the BA45 variant uh, have been detected in New Zealand. That, that tends to support a pretty good surveillance network at present. And in any of the scenarios that you looked at, I mean, do any of those scenarios, would they see New Zealand have to go back to, you know, very strict COVID measures, lockdowns? Yeah. I think those are, those are the sort of responses that we've described as being in reserve, and, and decisions about that would be taken by ministers at the time, based on our public health risk assessment, which is the process we go through. And in fact, we'll be doing another one tomorrow. Possibly for either of you, on pre-departure testing, can I ask what the epidemiological or medical basis is for not being able to remove that requirement now? I think the Prime Minister has spoken about potentially needing to have a process to identify variants of, of concern, but could, could that be captured through requiring positive tests from new arrivals to undergo serological or PCR testing? Uh, I know Cabinet discussed this just yesterday. And uh, I, I, I can't preempt what their discussion was, but I'm sure that if there, are, the Prime Minister has already said that it, it will be removed by the end of July, uh, and so if that if that timing changes, I know that ministers will announce that. I just do want to go to the point you've made though about the role of pre departure the, the key role of pre departure testing is it does prevent people with an acute infection uh, getting on a plane, so it does help to reduce the burden here. What we're seeing, and, and just to build on what um, Dr Town said, what we're seeing from our provision of rats tests to people coming across the border, about 90% of people are doing that test and uploading the result. That's a fantastic uh, response, really. And then about 2 to 3% are returning a positive test. That's even with pre-departure testing, so uh, it's, that's very important. We now have got in place our ability, if people return a positive rapid antigen test, we can look and see if they then do a PCR test, if it appears in our lab database. If not, we can follow them up and ask them to get a PCR test. At the moment we're seeing about a, uh, a third of them are doing that, and then those are going through to ESR for whole genome sequencing. So we're getting several hundred samples a week, and uh, as you're aware, we're seeing the BA2 12 one variant in particular, the BA4 and 5, and we're detecting those in the community now in very low proportions. Uh, most, most of our uh, virus in the community is still the BA2 variant. Final comment on that, it's still early but WHO's current assessment is that the impact of those newer sub-variants of Omicron is less if the infection in the community has largely been the BA2 rather than BA1 subvariant. Uh, over 85% of ours through the Omicron outbreak have been BA2. So our hope is that puts us in a better position. And so these new subvariants coming through, rather than being big additional waves, are likely just to 
slowly take, uh, take over or overtake uh, the BO2 subvariant. Right. Not to like to simplify, but the, the matter of timing is it's really more a political issue than a medical one. Is that a reasonable assessment? Uh, what it would say is it's a decision for ministers. Just on um, ministers, uh, we saw yesterday Chris Hipkins no longer has the COVID-19 portfolio. Do you have any reflections of your time working with him in that space now that it's been handed on to someone else? Uh, well, I, you know, uh, I work very closely with Minister Hipkins in that role uh, over the last 18 months or so, and um, uh, I enjoyed working with him. Uh, likewise, Minister Verrill has been an associate minister for the COVID-19 response and has become in, you know, increasingly involved in the work, and she's now picking that up, and of course uh, she brings to that role um, her, her background as an infectious disease uh, specialist as well, so we'll look forward to working closely with her through this next phase. A colleague in Southland tells me Gore Hospital is closed to visitors because of an influenza outbreak. Can you, how is the Ministry supporting smaller rural hospitals who are dealing with influenza on top of helping public hospitals manage COVID cases? Yes, yeah, so um, I wasn't aware of that, but this would be something that you, you might do in not just a small hospital, but if you had an influenza outbreak, for example, on a ward. Uh, in, a, in a hospital, you would close that ward as well to visitors. So that's not unusual. I do know, again, having been down in, um, <clears throat> in southern DHB in Dunedin just on Friday, that they're working closely with, with their rural hospitals as well to support them uh, if they have outbreaks. And as you pointed out, um, it's at the moment more likely to be flu rather than COVID. Uh, any final questions? If not, I think we've had a great session. Thank you very much uh, to everyone for coming up today. Kia ora.